Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video, we are, uh, you know what we're doing? We're following the money. It's a thing people say. It works in this one, though, to be fair, because not only do we have, you know, what we usually have in these old videos, we also got, like, one of them, like, Wolf of Wall Street type dealios. It's mad. It's set in Florida, so that's not uh, surprising at all. And it all began when an attorney at a law firm vanished. This would lead to uh, house of cards essentially <laughs> tumbling down and a, just generally turning into a big old poop show. My favorite. Let's give it a go. So Fort Lauderdale today, pfft, look at us, hitting the big time. Even I can't tell when I'm being sarcastic anymore. Okay, so Fort Lauderdale, Southeast Florida. I don't think I need to yap away about it too much. It's, it's fairly well known. Big city in Florida, part of the Miami metro area. Done and done. In downtown Fort Lauderdale was a law firm. Pretty big, had offices all across America and a few beyond. And it went by the name Rothstein Rosenfeld and Adler. Now to say they were strong, maybe, is, is the word, that, that would be an understatement if that was the word. I'm not using that word. They were like politically well connected. They were big dogs and the guy at the tippity top was a guy named Scott Rothstein. I'm with Scott Rothstein from Rothstein and Rosenfeld firm. How are you? I'm doing great. What could be bad here? Look at this. It's, it's unbelievable. A, it's a great party, and you know what? Just the fact that you have so much love for your, your career and what you do for your employees, it's a, it's a love of, to watch you, how happy you, got, you really are, and what a nice party you're putting on. How do you feel tonight? I feel unbelievable. It's an unbelievable group. There is nothing here that would have happened without all these people here. They're absolutely incredible. I'm blessed to have the greatest group of lawyers, the greatest support staff. It's what it's all about. This, this is really all for them. This has nothing to do with me. I would never be here if it wasn't for them. Scott was the guy everyone knew. Gregarious, fun, flashy, a good bit of crack to be around, and he was the managing shareholder, chairman, and CEO of Rothstein, Rosenfeld, and Adler. He would rub elbows with the rich and famous. He himself was from New York, growing up though in Fort Lauderdale when his family moved there as a teen. He got his law degrees, beginning in that beeswax in 1988. He worked his way up, partnered with various law firms in the Miami metro area until 2004, when the name Rothstein, Rosenfeld and Adler was the one on the business cards. And it was a juggernaut. They also had great parties. This is unreported cash. <laughs> Take that out of the film. <laughs> This is not showing up on your W-2. <laughs> That's right, we're breaking the fucking law. Who lawyers? If we're not going to break the law, who is? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Over 70 attorneys worked at the practice, one of which was 38-year-old Melissa Lewis, and she had been there since, since the, the law firm began. Melissa was one of the good ones. She loved law, she was a workaholic, and she always did a good job for her clients. And she, Missy to those closest, knew how to blow off steam at the work parties. And it was far from, you know, penthouse law offices that Melissa was raised, let me tell you. She was a high school dropout, struggled with school, but not for lack of noodle. She just wanted to be out of there, in the world. In her late 20s, the law would come a call it. And in university, Nova Southeastern University Law School, Scott would actually end up being a professor of hers, and with her ending up as an intern at his firm. There, Melissa would become fast friends with Deborah Viegas, who she met on her first day. As I said, they were there from the very, very start. They saw the thing grow and keep, keep growing, and it would eventually become a big old flashy behemoth as the fun books rolled in. Melissa's main focus was in labor and employment law, and she was a good one. In her spare time, she volunteered helping victims of domestic violence or cooking. She was shit hot at cooking shit. Melissa would be married for five years, ending in a nightmare divorce. 
She was supported through that by her friend Deborah, as Deborah would be supported through her own divorce by Melissa. Melissa would eventually become, in 2008, a partner at the firm, the first female partner, and she was hoping to go on and become a judge eventually. Deborah, Bessie Mate, would become the company's chief operating officer. This year, the Jason Brand Shining Star Award goes to the absolute love of my life, the person for which I really owe everything that I have achieved, to Deborah B. Avis, gentlemen, Shining Star. And with that, we're waiting to accomplish for us a very small token of our appreciation. A check for a thousand dollars. Thank you, baby. I love you. Put the thunder without you. Now, the end uh, of Melissa Lewis would be the beginning of the end for the entire law firm. It was on the 5th of March 2008, Melissa, 39 years old, and had just become a partner at the firm. That evening, Deborah tried to call her buddy a couple of times, no answer. The very next morning, the, t the Thursday morning, Deborah went in, no show. Melissa hadn't called, and calls going in the opposite direction went unanswered. Melissa lived in a place called Plantation, about a 20 minute drive from the offices on Las Olas Boulevard. With no sign of her, Deborah went to the big guy, Scott. And Scott, well connected, he immediately was on to his buddies down at the station, and so they could get a move on finding her or seeing what the crack was. Maybe she was fine. Maybe she wasn't, and if I'm telling it, it's not looking good for her. Her house seemed fine, no sign of a disturbance, stuff wasn't, you know, thrown all about the place. Her car was gone though, and in this garage, they did find something weird. It's like a orange shit on the door. If that's P, go see a doctor. It was actually a spray mist, and you know, the way you spray mist, it would clump, clump together. At this point though, what exactly it was, was anyone's guess, but it was the only the only clue left behind. Well, to be fair, it was obvious to those who were there what that orange shit was because they immediately started coughing and their eyes burning. It was pepper spray. So uh, that's the first red flag. Something bad happened, bad enough that Melissa had to defend herself. Deborah knew Melissa carried pepper spray. Most likely she never made it inside the home. That's why nothing was out of place. As soon as she pulled in to the garage, something happened and then she was gone in her own car. Rothstein, Rosenfeld and Adler were known about town. This wouldn't be a rinky dink investigation. This would be big news and the firm would be pushing the police hard to solve whatever happened. Scott was actually the, the attorney for the police union. So he'd be, he, you know, he was the one who went to bat for them. So now it was their turn. So what did they learn? Well, they had the pepper spray. Melissa had two dogs. One of them had actually been pepper sprayed too. Poor fella. A button was found. So as you know, with the spray, there was some kind of fight. Her last movements before she got home were traced. She left work around seven, then went to a, a, you know, a nearby supermarket. And from there, the distances, you know, they could judge what time she arrived back in that garage at roughly half eight-ish. Something happened then as soon as she, probably as soon as she opened her car door. Now, thankfully though, for Melissa in her fancy, you know, lawyer car, it had GPS. So they could, they could find out where her car had gone. It was discovered a mile away in a car park. They found her jacket missing a button her shoes, and it all, it all smelled of pepper spray. Not a whole lot else though. No fingerprints that weren't Melissa's, either in the house or the car. They would have to wait for, uh, you know, to test these items for DNA, and that would take, I mean, that takes time. It takes a long time. Time, which kidnapped? Melissa didn't have. And then it would turn out that she was already out of time. Two days later, her body was discovered in a canal about eight miles south of where her car was found. The autopsy revealed Melissa Lewis had been strangled to death before being dumped. Probably murdered in the garage. 
So then, um, theories sprang up, you know, one being a, it was a robbery gone wrong, right? Melissa, she had a Prada bag, she had a five grand, you know, what? She had diamonds, she had this, she was that, she had that. So somebody tried to bust in, tried to nab her stuff, and it went, it went wrong. She was able to defend herself and blah, 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 blah. Then Nerd said no, you know, she lived in a nice neighborhood, there wouldn't be break-ins. And if there was, this was a burglary gone wrong or whatever, why would they wait? They, they would have gone in when she wasn't home, not when she was home. It seemed then like someone was waiting for her, that this was personal, that this was planned. Someone she knew, maybe. One of her clients, maybe? Well, the area of law she worked in didn't really seem to fit. Plus, I mean, she was, she was well-liked, she wasn't abrasive at all, you know. Uh, she had an ex-husband, he was he had a strong alibi, wasn't him. Did Deborah know anyone as her best friend? You know, they hung out together all the time. And Deborah said no, she never hung out with like, strange men or you know, not, not like that. I mean, you know, they would usually just have quiet nights in, cook food together, that kind of thing. But they could only triangulate, not pinpoint. So they began to ask people close to the investigation if they knew anyone in those areas. Deborah knew, but the person she knew of didn't know Melissa. Like at all. Tony Villegas, Deborah's ex-husband. They had been married for 17 years, one year divorced at this stage. He worked in trains and had no criminal record at all, but one record the police had were the phone records. And Melissa's phone traveled the same route he worked, on trains after the kidnapping. They went to give him a go. How well did you, uh, do you know this, uh, your Deborah's, Deborah's friend? Uh, I know her from her, I've seen her, uh, a few times. Did you guys ever have any problems, maybe? Something like that? Never, never. I don't think I ever spoke to her more than two words. Do you know if she's had anything to do with what you're going through right now with Deborah? Divorce? I don't know, and uh, and I really don't don't care. I mean, I, that wouldn't bother you if I, she did. No, no, no. The thing is that I just want to get away from my wife. I just want to be at peace. Do you have anything to do with the uh, with Melissa's death? No. Her phone after it was stolen. Go to the area of your house and stay there overnight came to work with you the next day and traveled north with the train because the train has GPS on it, doesn't it? It was on the train, okay? And someone else here knows Melissa, lives in your house, comes to work with you. You had the phone, okay? Listen, this I'll be honest with you. This doesn't look very good for you. But I don't even know. They searched his house, his car, his work area, nothing. The last time that Tony and Melissa, to your knowledge, would have had actual contact together, face-to-face -to -face type contact. Prior to the homicide. I think their last face-to-face, because -face, they, I, I mean, I could probably count on one hand the number of times that they had a face-to-face. -face Was Tony ever at Melissa's house? On two occasions. One occasion we went there to pick up a Bowflex. A weight bench? Yes. Are you and Tony yeah. still together at this time? Mm -hmm. So this would have been like a year or plus before? Oh, yeah. And to your knowledge, is he, was he ever to the house after that? To her house after that? I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the last time. They didn't really have any kind of motive either, either. Like, he barely knew Melissa. Nobody even really remembers him ever talking to her. The only thing they could think of was that he was a very jealous, jealous person and that maybe he blamed Melissa for for uh, the divorce. Deborah would say during, you know, the marriage, he was possessive. He was violent. Melissa helped her leave. So maybe. Melissa's funeral was huge. There was a massive turnout, all paid for by Scott Rothstein. A few days later, Tony was arrested and charged with first degree murder. He pled not guilty. As the investigation continued, however, shit would blow up. A new financial scandal is brewing in Broward County, this time involving a prominent and well-connected attorney. Scott Rothstein is at the center of a federal investigation, and the other partners in the law firm are now scrambling to figure out if they got tricked in the latest high-profile Ponzi scheme. See, Scott. Oh, Scotty, he had a flashy life. Flashy even for a top, top lawyer. 
Private jets, yachts, exotic cars, and I mean like exotic. Ferraris, Rolls Royces, Lamborghinis, Bugattis worth $1.6 million? How about two? Why? His watch collection was worth over a million dollars. Just that. I could keep going on and on about all the shit he owns, it, after a certain, it doesn't even matter after a certain point. Another lawyer would say about uh, Scott, quote, How Rothstein was able to generate this kind of income practicing law seemed impossible. After Melissa's death, Scott had a security detail. He was worried, you know, he could be next maybe. When Melissa's case was solved and it was deemed to be a, a personal murder, he kept the security. Then Scott was doing a bit of thinking and he sent out a, a little assignment to uh, everybody who worked at the law firm, you know, clickety clickety. It's like, got one for you, you know, pop quiz, hot shot. He had to know, right? And this was for a very powerful client, so get it right. He needed to know, he needs to know today, what countries around the globe didn't have extradition treaties with either the United States or Israel. I'll tell you now, the list is very short. The reason why, Scott said, was the client was an Israeli citizen that had renounced their US citizenship, and indictments were coming. Talk of fraud, money laundering, and embezzlement. <laughs> so, a few people uh, replied, and it turns out it's Morocco. Morocco, ladies and gentlemen. You might want to keep that uh, information in your back pocket. Uh, yeah. Two weeks later, Scott was on a plane to Morocco in a private jet with millions of dollars in duffel bags. Outside a Broward courtroom, attorneys circle as one of the most politically powerful law firms in South Florida is about to implode. Right now, all we know is that uh, the money's gone, Scott's gone, uh, and, and we're trying to find out what happened. It's, it's too early to tell precisely what kind of scheme it was. The Scott he's talking about is Scott Rothstein, the high-flying, spiky-haired attorney who led the law firm Rothstein Rosenfeld Adler. Now that law firm he started with Stuart Rosenfeld in 2002 is coming apart. I'm just very sad to see a beautiful thing that we built and fall apart. Now guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna shock you here, but I know nothing about like financial shite. So I'm gonna explain this part as, as simply as I can. I'm sure you all know what a Ponzi scheme is, but for those in the back, it's when you have a scheme where you get people to invest with you and you'll give them great returns, but you know, you just take the money and then you eventually need to pay back them and their, you know, their investment. So you need to swindle more people into your little scheme. Probably the most famous example is Bernie Madoff, who made off with everyone's money. Ponzi schemers will usually advertise you know, incredible returns on their investments, way beyond you know, anything you would actually get in reality. So then you invest with them. After a while, they'll have to pay you back. Therefore, they have to get new investors. They'll do this for a couple of years because they want to build up, you know, reputation and money and then they'll, you know, the idea would be they would just do a legger. Doesn't usually you know, work that way in today's day and age. And it's, you know, it's a tough scheme because you constantly have to be getting new money in. You know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. This usually ends with, you know, people losing the millions they invested. A lot of time, this ends up being people's uh, pensions, which is quite disgusting. Scott Rothstein's Ponzi was worth about one billion dollars. Nice chunk of change. And how he did it was like this. He would settle discrimination cases before trial. These would often be sensitive cases and whistleblower cases. You know, people wanted to, they didn't want to go to trial, they wanted to keep it hush hush. Now settlements, you know, they can be kind of difficult to actually get the money out of. So many people would, instead of waiting for the settlement, they would just take a lump of cash instead of, you know, the full money they were due owed. So what Scott would do would be he would find investors to invest, i.e. give him money to pay off the awarded person, and then he would tell the investor when the settlement comes back in, you'll make your money back and then some. The investor was usually guaranteed at least a 20% return within three months. This was something along the lines of, and I'm, people out there will probably correct me, but uh, I believe it's pre-settlement funding. Now though, um, many times, the settlement didn't exist. Hence the Ponzi scheme. Scotty created fake legal documents, fake bank accounts, fake bank details. He got investors to invest and the money went whoo into his back pocket. His victims were mostly hedge funds. After Melissa's disappearance, Scott 
And, you know, he thought it might be related to the Ponzi. I mean, the thing is about Melissa, nobody really knows how much Melissa knew about the whole scheme. Eventually, all of the partners would be arrested. So when the Ponzi scheme shit hit the fan, it became part of the investigation. Was Melissa aware of anything that Scott was involved with? And I'm, I'm going to use the term the Ponzi scheme. No. Um, or any discussion between you and Scott about having Melissa killed? Absolutely not. Are you aware of any discussion or conspiracy to hire Tony for Melissa Lewis's murder? No. Before or I would have let him kill Melissa, I would have let him move back into my house. That's the biggest regret that I have in all of this. Melissa may not have known. Deborah did know, though she helped forge documents. So, in autumn 2009, when investors, you know, started to smell something hinky and started going to the FBI, Scott fled the country. He fled the country wearing this shirt, man. All the money in the world cannot buy taste. In Morocco, he sent suicide text messages to his partners, but he was eventually talked out of it and talked into returning to America. I went away for the purpose of making sure that I had my head on straight, that when I came back, I had already been through all the emotional things, had been through the hysterics, had been through all the other things that you go through when you realize that you have done something that you shouldn't have done. I will not stop until every single penny is paid back. Where he turned himself in. And it turned out Scott was an FBI informant. They knew about this Ponzi scheme for quite some time. Rothstein, 26 people involved in the scheme were convicted, including the other partners, Rosenfeld and Adler. Rothstein himself was still screwed, so, uh, you know, don't you worry. In 2010, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Deborah would get sentenced to 10 years, serving four. So, as Tony's trial inched further for the murder of Melissa Lewis, the Ponzi scheme became a part of it. And it was learned that Scott and Melissa had had a relationship previously. Eventually, though, surprisingly, it appeared it wasn't linked at all. They were completely separate. Tony went on trial in 2016, after having a term of being declared incompetent. The trial didn't last that long. The evidence against him? Circumstantial, but there was a lot of it. His DNA was found on her jacket. His car was seen in the same car park Melissa's car was found in. A person saw him scrubbing pepper spray off his arms, the day after Melissa disappeared. And then you got the cell phone evidence. He took this woman at the prime of her life and he discards her like a piece of trash in the canal because she was an obstacle. So if you believe that she's dead, if you believe that he's the person that did it and that when he did it, he had a premeditated intent to do so, that ladies and gentlemen is first degree murder. Now, one thing the defense brought up you know, when they're going against the witnesses to try and discredit them, was that uh, Scott had offered a $250,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. So the defense said they were just making it up. But of course, by this stage, Scott didn't have two pennies to rub together, so... It took the jury two hours to find him guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison. And that's the end of, uh... That old one, that old chapter. It's quite a... Quite explosive, kind of what I imagine Scott to be like. He is under a fake name in prison because he was an informant, so good for him. Quite a scheme he had going on, he didn't waste it, I'll give him that. I do wonder if Melissa knew or was involved, but but it doesn't make her murder any less tragic for that, that asshole who's just a jealous bitch. I mean, the scheme would have fallen apart if Melissa hadn't been killed, but to me, it's it's more surprising that they weren't linked than if they were. Match it. Thank you so much for watching. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to be here with this old guy. All right, here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next old video. Until then, please take care of yourselves. I love you. Mike.